Okay. So let's begin. Um, the first thing I want you to do, and again, by the way, I am Praveen Medori, and I'll be teaching Engineering 17 um, this summer semester. And thank you for enrolling in the course, and thank you for um, joining the Zoom session. First things first, even before we begin with the course, what I want you to do is to um, log into your Canvas, okay? This is the most important thing that you want to do at the very beginning of the semester, okay? Is to log into Canvas and make sure you are, uh, click on that profile picture of yours and then um, enable the notification so that whenever I create an announcement, okay, corresponding to that, I'm notified immediately, okay? As you can see, there are four different levels of priorities here, okay? The green check box here says that you're notified immediately of that activity, okay? The little clock here says that you're notified on a daily basis. The calendar says on a weekly basis. And the X mark says you're not notified at all, okay? The announcements that I make, and I promise you I'm not going to spam your inbox, I'm not going to send you a million emails or anything. It's important for the, all the important course announcements are going to be sent via Canvas announcement. And I need to know that uh, this is one reliable way for me to reach you and, uh, and convey an important message to you. So the first thing you want to do is to log into Canvas, um, click on uh, profile picture, select the notifications, okay? So on the profile picture, select the notifications, okay? And then make sure the announcements is selected to be the green checkbox where you're notified right away, okay? So about class cancellations, extra credit opportunities, homeworks, all of this important information is relayed through Canvas, okay? So that's the first thing you want to do. The next thing, really important thing you want to do is to log into Moodle, okay? Canvas is the platform that I use mainly for communicating, okay? Most of the course material itself is hosted on Moodle, okay? Moodle is the main platform where the uh, material, exams, notes, uh, YouTube videos, just about every course material relevant, relevant material is available on Moodle, even your homeworks and the exams are going to be online and on Moodle, okay? So the first thing you want to do is to make sure you enroll into the Engineering 17 course for Moodle. Your enrollment to Canvas was automatic. Your enrollment to Moodle is not. You have to enroll. And for that, you have to look at the syllabus that I sent, the announcement that I sent online. Okay? The fact that you are here tells me that you all looked at uh, Moodle. And then you look at the announcement. Okay? So the next thing I want you to do is to make sure you have access to homework, okay? So the homeworks, about which I'll talk more in detail shortly, okay? The homeworks are all online, and I want to make sure that you have access to homework. Try out the first homework. If you're having problems accessing this homework, if you're having problems, if you're not able to see this for any reason, okay? Now is the time to let me know. Okay, I manually set the deadlines in for each of these homes. So it's very important that you double check me and cover for my blind spots. Okay, even so the exams are going to be online as well. So that's um, an opportunity for you to um, further down the lane, um, double check and let me know if there are any issues. Okay. So now um, let me quickly talk about the homework schedule, okay? Before we go into the details of um, details of the course itself, okay? The homework uh, schedule is also posted on Canvas, but the one thing that you want to remember is the 
deadlines for the different homeworks are all organized around the deadlines for the exams. Okay, the first thing you want to remember is that the exams, there are three exams. Okay, there are three exams. The midterm exam one, which is on the 20th of July. Okay, midterm exam two, which is on the 4th of August. And then the final exam itself, which is on the 13th of August. Okay, and as you can see, the homeworks are all um, scheduled around the midterm exam. So for the exam that's on the 720, you have three exams, three homeworks, or four homeworks that are due the day before. Okay, so uh, this is going to be a pretty busy semester. So 19th of July, you have four homeworks coming due. So it's a good idea to begin your homeworks today. One of the homeworks is going to become available today, right? So it's a good idea to begin working on these homeworks right away as and when they become available, okay? Just so they don't pile up on you. Um, and all of these four homeworks on the 19th of July may be a little too hectic, okay? Similarly, the second midterm is on the fourth. So four or five of your homeworks are actually coming due on the third of August, okay? So you can see the idea when I say um, the exams uh, kind of set the deadlines and around those dates, the homeworks are um, arranged. So another set of homeworks is going to become um, due around the 12th of August, while the exam itself, the final exam is on the 13th. Okay, so you want to pay attention to the open date, um, the dates, the exam, the homeworks are available, and the close date. Okay, all the homeworks, all the homeworks are available until 11.59 p.m. of the close date. Okay, unlike the exams, exams are strictly during the class time. You don't get, you don't get until the 11.59 p.m. of that day. Exams close right after the class time ends. That's 9.35, okay? So that's something you want to remember. Um, and then the homeworks, I have had a couple of students who sent me frantically, um, sent me an email in the last minute saying that they forgot that there are last two homeworks and because of that, their grades suffer, okay? And then I sympathize with you. I'm sorry about that, but I'm afraid I can't do anything about it because um, I want to be fair to everybody. I can't give you grades just because um, you happen to forget that the uh, homeworks are due on a particular day. It, I have to be fair to everybody in the class. Okay, as much as I want to give you grades, as much as I want to make sure that you. Um, are happy. Um, my first priority is to make sure that I'm equitable, make sure that I, uh, I'm not giving away score to you that is not uh, given to somebody else. Okay, that's not available to somebody else. Okay, now um, the, the next thing you want to do is to make sure that you test your access to homework on Moodle. Very important. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, talk about the course a little bit. Again, um, I'm Praveen Meduri. The best way to reach me would be through email. Okay, the best way to reach me would be through email. And I'm quickly, there's a fairly quick 24 hour turnaround time. If for some reason you don't hear back from me within two days, you're welcome to send me an email, a reminder email. Okay, I get a ton of email every day and it's uh, possible that I might lose your um, email in the flood of emails that I get every single day, okay? Um, the Zoom link to attend the class is right here. And then, um, as you know, the class is online. We'll all be meeting online, okay? Um, special thanks to Professor Russ Tekro, who curated the course material he built as you go through the class, as you look at some of the videos posted online, so, uh, on Moodle, some of his, um, the exam, some of the homeworks 
um, as a matter of fact, most of the course material that is available to us is provided by Russ Tepro. Um, I thank him for being kind enough to be willing to share his material. Okay, so the course content itself is about writing mesh and node equations. Okay, we look at the DC and transient analysis of linear systems. We look at the application of Kirchhoff's law, Ohm's law, Thevenin's and Norton's equivalent, uh, maximum power transfer theorem. So in other words, these are all a set of handy tools in your reporter, okay? A set of handy tools, a bunch of um, tools in your arsenal to analyze any electrical circuit. Most importantly, linear circuits okay so this course is all all about providing you a set of tools to analyze circuit okay there's going to be some overlap between what you learned in the past physics 11c okay some of the series and parallel combination of circuits resistors capacitors so on and so forth there is going to be a little bit of overlap between what you learned in your previous courses and then um, in this course okay physics 11c and math 45 are the prerequisite the textbook is um, nelson riddle it's a it's a bible for um, electric circuits we use the 11th edition okay i'm not too particular about edition if you have um, another edition of the textbook that you can get your hands on. Um, you're welcome to do that. I will be using the 11th edition for the homeworks, for the exams, for uh, class examples, so on and so forth. Okay. And like I mentioned, the best way to reach me would be through email. Okay. And then when it comes to the Great breakdown for this course. The midterm, there are three exams. The midterm, one and two, are worth 15% each. Okay. The final exam is worth 15%. So the exams themselves, which are timed, once only. So you can take the exam only one time as opposed to the homeworks, which you can take any number of times. It's no limit to the number of times you can take the exam. So it's really advised. There's no reason why you should not um, take the exams, homeworks, over and over again, okay? And aim for a full 100%, 55 uh, points the homework. In addition to those, there is some practice quizzes as well. So if you can see, if you go back to the Moodle page, the entire semester is laid out to you. Okay, so there's going to be two more links in here. There's one link right underneath the Zoom session. There's going to be one link to YouTube videos. That's the recording of the class videos. And then there's going to be a so there's going to be a Google Drive link to all the class notes that I'm going to annotate in the class. Okay, so in addition to that, each chapter has a set of objectives. Okay, and then there's lecture slides. And in addition to that, there's a bunch of videos. So that's true for every chapter. Okay, as we walk through the Moodle site, you'll see that each chapter has a set of objectives, set of lecture notes, and then um, some videos. And in addition to that, there may be some um, additional appendix, appendices um, provided to you, standard resistance values, some tutorials, so on and so forth. If you scroll all the way down, Okay, it's going to be homeworks available to you all the way down around the lower third. 
of the page. Along the lower third of the page, there's going to be homeworks available to you. Right below the homeworks is the exams. The exams may not be available yet, but they're, they are there when it comes time to take the exams, okay? And there is some additional material. Practice quizzes that are not counted towards your grade are available all the way at the bottom, okay? So that's, that's kind of the lay of the land. For more. Okay, so um, so that's where you want you can find all of these material. Okay, that's where you can find all of these midterms, final exam, homework, and practice quizzes. The course goals are to introduce fundamental tools of linear circuit analysis. Okay, linear circuit analysis. We'll be talking a whole lot about analysis. Okay. Um, Develop the fundamentals of circuit, including wires, resistors, capacitors, inductors, voltage and current sources, operational amplified capacitors, um, inductors. Okay, we want to prepare students for more advanced courses in electronic applications. Okay, courses like 117, 108, 109, all of these courses, okay, they assume certain basic working knowledge of engineering 17, okay? This is an online course. The courses are all, the videos are available to you online. So my, and, and let me make an important point here. The main study material will be the videos available on Moodle. Okay, we meet Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, right? So our meeting is only um, an additional material, okay? An additional material. So you must mainly rely on the videos posted on more. Okay, if you have questions on the example problems, if you have any questions related to Moodle videos, um, then that, that's a good topic for discussion in the class, okay? It's a good topic for discussion in the class. Now, and then um, there are certain things that we, that we tell a bit, um, that the students will be able to learn in this class, that students will be able to identify linear systems and represent those systems in schematic form that students will be able to apply Kirchhoff's um, laws, Ohm's law, simplify circuit using series and parallel, uh, parallel simplifications, okay? Form node and loop analysis, okay? You'll see me talk about a bunch of different analysis techniques, okay? So in this class, like I mentioned earlier, it's about giving a bunch of tools a set of tools for you to use and apply on your uh, linear circuits, okay? Apply concepts of energy, power, um, to solving circuit problems. This is one of the skills that you will pick up, okay? Identify and model first order electronic systems involving capacitors and inductors, and perform circuit analysis by steady state phaser method of time varying signals, okay? So towards chapter nine, we will, until chapter one, okay? We'll be discussing, let me show you the chapters that we have here. The list of topics, okay? So we'll be talking about chapters one, two, three, four, five, and six. So we'll be, looking at these chapters, chapters one through six, and then seven and eight are topics that are left for engineering 117. Then move on to talking about chapter nine, okay? Chapter nine is sinusoidal source, okay? Where the voltage source or the current source is not a constant DC, 
but a time varying signal as opposed to the sources that we discuss in chapters one through six okay the sources that we discuss here are dc sources their voltage or current signal is not changing as a function of time they're not time varying signals okay so in chapter nine we look at sinusoidal source and the handy way to represent sinusoidal source using phasers okay so that's preview of what to expect now this is a um, course that is important to mechanical engineers fundamental to electrical engineers um, um, very very fundamental um, course for computer engineering as well and that's one of the reasons why it's a required force for uh, mechanical computer and uh, computer science okay let's see something in the chat zoom meetings on canvas or moodle and um, the question is mina asks are the uh, are the videos recordings of zoom meetings going to be posted on canvas or moodle yes they're going to be made available on youtube and then there's going to be uh, a link provided to that on moodle okay other questions please okay by a show of hands how many of you are from mechanical um, program okay a couple of you oh handful of you Nina. good 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 you can go ahead and lower your hat from computer science computer engineering okay jeshi you can lower your hat um, electrical engineering okay good all right perfect um thank you lower you you can lower your hand thank you so um i get um i th that's for me to get a feel for um the general spread in the different areas okay so like i mentioned this this is an important course for electrical engineers computer engineers mechanical engineers because there's a lot of parallels between um mechanical components and electrical components i'll give you an example there was a time um a personal example i was working on um i was working on a tuning fork gyroscope okay a micro a mems micro electromechanical system design okay it's a teeny tiny in the micrometer range um a tuning fork okay a tuning fork gyroscope actually okay and i was asked to model the behavior of the gyroscope using electrical components so uh, here i had a mechanical system okay that was vibrating at its natural frequency okay that was vibrating at its resonant frequency okay and i was tasked with the job of modeling it with an equivalent rlc circuit okay such that the resonant frequency of this gyroscope matches with the resonant frequency of this rlc circuit okay so there is a resistance there is inductance there is capacitance so the idea is even if you're a mechanical engineer um dabbling in mechanical components okay they have electrical components they have parallels in electrical component often times when you want to model the behavior even before um even before fabricating them even before designing committing to design what you will do is uh, to model them and simulate them in electrical domain so the idea i'll give you another example okay think about a spring in mechanical domain okay what's the energy stored in a spring half k x squared where k is the spring constant x is the energy stored in a spring k 
okay? As you will see, this form, okay, half times kx squared is very familiar and it's, it's uh, ubiquitous. You'll see this over and over again, one half cv squared, the energy stored in a capacitor, okay? Where c is the capacitance, v is the voltage across the capacitor, okay? One half mv squared, the kinetic energy of a moving body with mass m and velocity p. So all of these familiar forms of energy, they, they have parallels across different domains. Mechanical domain uh, has the parallel in electrical domain, has a parallel in physical domain, okay? Kinetic. Um, energy components. So the idea is just because you're a mechanical engineer does not mean um, you do not need to know electrical components. Okay, so there are occasions where you find yourself needing to have the skill of modeling electrical components. Okay, or mechanical components using electrical components. Okay, so let's talk about the exams and the homeworks. Okay, homeworks will be completed online completely through Moodle activities. Okay, and then the problem shall be from the textbook or created by the instructor, that is Professor Lastekro. Okay, you can submit the homeworks as many times as you want until you get a perfect 100% score on the assignment. So there is no reason to not attempt um, to get a le less than um, perfect score, okay? You want to get a 100% score on that, okay? Again, it's also a good practice for the exams. Um, the exams are going to be 60 minute um, midterms. The midterm exams are going to be 60 minutes. And the final exam is going to be two hours. The exams are once and done, so you only get one opportunity to take the one chance to take the exam. The practice quizzes are meant to simulate and model the exams. Okay, so there's going to be 12 practice quizzes, 60 minutes each. Okay, there's, there are once and done as well. Okay, only one submission is allowed. So before you're ready to take the final exam, when you're still, um, if you want to get a preview of what to get, what to expect on the midterm or on the final exam, this would be a good time to, this would be a good place to practice quizzes, to take them once, okay? And then that's the general grading policy I apply to you, okay? So questions, please. Questions so far. Questions, comments, concerns. Okay. Now, um, fortunately or unfortunately, we are in this online format. The format that works best for me is face-to-face -to -face interaction, where I can, um, where I can call on students. I can. Um, I can uh, have a face-to-face -face interaction, eye contact, make eye contact, ask questions, and keep the class more like a discussion section rather than a rather than a, a monologue. So, what is your opinion? Did you, how many of you um, took courses in summer session one? Okay, so what's your general general opinion um, about online courses? Does anybody have a preference um, for one or the other? Julian? I see something in the chat. Um, I think it's fine. I've taken online courses before. No, nothing as short term as half of the summer section but yeah. I like having access to a lot of different materials. So I'll, I'll oftentimes look at YouTube videos and other notes. So having a course that's designed around those already kind of works for me. Yeah, yeah. 
Absolutely. That's true. And it has been a blessing in disguise for me. In the past, um, I have been postponing the idea of posting videos on YouTube and making class recordings and posting them on YouTube. But um, um, in this situation where I'm left with no option but to do that, um, well, it has been a blessing in disguise. Um, as they say, looking at it, seeing an opportunity in a calamity, I have been able to. And then this is some of the things, one of the things that students have been asking me over and over again is to be able to post um, YouTube videos so that they can go back and watch them later. So that has been a blessing in disguise. Who else? Ch Chatura, Chatura? Did you have, um, did you want to add something else? Okay. Riley, Riley says, I enjoy the online format as well. Good, good, good. Um, Wei Kuan Liu says, um, will exams be worked online or on paper? Then I scan and email to you. No, the exams are all going to be um, administered via the quiz program on Moodle. So you plug in the numbers, it'll automatically grade. Okay, so there's no scanning the homeworks. There's no manual grading of the exams. It's all going to be calculated questions graded automatically by Moodle. So you get instant feedback. So you get instant score. Um, you get to um, revise over and over again, and you know where you went wrong. Okay. Um, Ilya says, can we go back and watch Zoom meetings? For sure. Uh, I'm going to post the class recordings on YouTube and make the link available on Moodle. Okay, so let me go back to Moodle here. Right here, okay? You see on the very top of the page, you see announcements, syllabus, homeworks, and then Zoom class link. Underneath that, there's going to be one link that says YouTube videos. There's going to be another link that says Google Drive um, class annotation. So that's the class notes. I like to mark up on the PowerPoints uh, on the PDF uh, of the class notes and then make colorful annotation. That will be available to you as well. So you don't have to um, be in a note-taking frenzy. The class notes is going to be available to you. Okay. Other comments, please. So you sure can go back and uh, watch the um, Zoom videos. Okay. All right. Let's see. So why take this course, CP and um, Triple um, students? This is fundamental to your understanding of upper division required courses. One one seven course, one o eight course. 109 course, okay? When you look at the electronic components, okay? Like uh, MOSFETs, bipolar junction transistors, diodes, okay? Um, and other electronic components, your knowledge in engineering 17, the knowledge and the, the analysis skills that you pick up here are going to be valuable for you to um, advance your knowledge in other upper division courses. Okay, so that's important. Most mechanical systems, so why is this important for mechanical engineers? Because most mechanical systems include controls, some kind of feedback. Okay, electronic systems. Um, um, so that's also included in your uh, mechanical system. So it's very really important that you, if, if you think about a mechanical system, um, it definitely has some kind of feedback electronic system um, and they move various amounts of power. Okay, so uh, there is a tight marriage between mechanical components and electrical components. You cannot be a good mechanical engineer be without a sound understanding of the um, basic electronic electrical uh, circuit principles. Okay. Now, increasingly, this takes the form of software controlled by electronic systems, okay? When you're controlling your uh, hardware, your mechanical components using software systems, okay? Um, electronic 
um, components. Okay, movement of movement by electronic motors and other circuit related techniques. Okay, so there's a fair amount of electrical um, principles at work. Even so, um, your fundamentals of engineering and PE engineering exam, they include questions for mechanical engineers that are related to electrical engineering. So it's going to be important for us in more than one ways, okay? More than just relevance to what courses um, we'll be using this or how it is relevant to a grade or your graduation, so on and so forth. More than that, what is important is that you pick up a set of valuable tools to analyze a circuit, to understand a circuit. If you see an electrical circuit, it's a set of resistors with a power source and with a bunch of active and passive elements. What you will see is it is very important to have the skill set necessary to analyze these circuits, to understand the behavior of circuits. And this course gives you the tools that are necessary to understand the circuit. Okay, first we acquire circuit analysis skills with only DC sources, okay? With DC sources that provide constant voltage or constant current. In chapter nine, like I mentioned, we look at sinusoidal, sinusoidal um, time varying sources, okay? In chapter six, chapter nine, we look at time varying sources where the signal is not a constant. Um, but it's a time varying signal. Okay, so um, in chapter 10, we bring it all together and we examine power. Okay, power. Um, ex we examine large power transfer basics, so on and so forth. Okay, um, in chapter 6, we look at capacitors and inductors as well. Okay, now uh, most students will find the is challenging even so in summer okay more so in summer uh, students find this uh, pace very challenging you should plan at least 10 hours per week in a regular semester okay now it's probably going to be double that time okay and i tell you what um, the time demand is absolutely what that this is a fundamental career knowledge and um, it provides valuable skill set. Okay. All right. So here is the list of topics that we'll be um, covering. Here is the lay of the land in terms of what to expect each week. Okay. And then there is the schedule of the exams. Okay. Exam and homework schedule. Okay. First thing you want to do, if you did not do already, is to obtain um, an ECS account, a Moodle account, okay? If for some reason it's taking more than a couple of days and you're uh, lagging behind on the homeworks, send me an email. I'll try to see if I can, um, if I can um, nudge your application, expedite the uh, process sooner than later. Okay, so some more useful information when you're taking the quizzes online, like I mentioned, okay, um, there's going to be the exams and homeworks are all graded automatically online by Moodle. So you want to pay attention to the acceptable format. Okay, Moodle likes certain formats and it does not like certain formats. So you want to, um, you want to familiarize with what um, are in line with uh, Moodle and what are not. Okay, so that's about, that's a pretty long introduction about what to expect in this course. And then make sure if you did not already, make sure you enroll into Moodle and access homework one. Okay, questions please, questions so far. All right, uh, I want one volunteer to keep an eye on the chat window. And if somebody um, raises a 
question in the chat. The volunteer, you will read it out to me. Chatura, can I pick you to be the volunteer to do that for me? No response. Cameron, would you be open to doing that? Look at the chat window, and if somebody, if if some chat comes in, um, alert me. Let's see. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Cameron. Now uh, you're going to let me know over the microphone. Okay. That when when you see any um, question over the chat. Okay. So let's start the first chapter. This should mostly be a review of what you learned in your previous course. Okay. You should, this should mostly be a review of what you learned in the uh, previous course, um, engineering, um, physics, physics um, 11C. Okay. Um, so the first chapter is circuit variables. Okay. Before we talk about that, let's quickly talk about an overview of the engineering and design process. Okay, this section introduces circuit theory, okay, which is the topic of this introductory course. Again, this is an introductory course, right? The circuit theory is a special linear case of EMAC, okay? Special um, Maxwell equations are simplified into a linear assumption you make certain assumptions okay study of static and moving electric charges okay so this course is all about studying static electric charges which we consider as voltage moving electric charges which is considered as current so we will be dealing a whole lot with voltage and current, okay? We, you have already been introduced to EMAG in your physics courses. Think of circuit theory as a simplification. Okay, simplified linear assumption of, of uh, electromagnetism. Okay, there are certain Assumptions that we make, linear, lumped circuit, lumped parameter, time invariant assumptions. Okay, these are the assumptions that we make. Okay, the assumptions are that electrical effects happen instantaneously throughout the system. Okay, that's the, that's the idea of lumped parameter. And we also assume linear. Okay, by linear we mean y equals to mx plus c. The equations that we see, okay? C dv by dt, okay? L di by dt, so on and so forth. V equals to ir, okay? Voltage in a capacitance, I is C dv by dt, current in a capacitance. V L di by dt, okay? The voltage in an inductor. So the idea you want to understand is that we assume a linear relationship. Voltage across a resistance is I times R. Similarly, the current across the capacitance is C times some kind of um, derivative, okay? So Y is mx plus C, is the general assumption that we make. And based on this assumption, we arrive, we use what is known as a superposition at a later time. Superposition principle. The idea is that um, the response of the circuit is going to be linear with respect to the input. That's an assumption that we will make and we'll el elaborate on that more. The other assumption, the other important assumption that we make, and these are all the equations that we are going to see sooner than later, okay? Linear assumption is that uh, the response represents a straight line. We can 
model the response of circuit elements using straight line equation. The third assumption is that the net charge on every component in a system is zero. Okay, the net charge is zero, meaning that um, this domain obeys the law of conservation of energy. Charge cannot be created. Separation of charges is okay. If there is some charge, some positive charge somewhere, there is an equivalent negative charge somewhere else. If I, if I, the separation of charges is all right. Okay, that's, that's possible, but not, um, a new charge cannot be created without an equivalent amount of um, opposite polarity charge somewhere else. Okay. So net charge, the net charge in the system is zero. Okay. And based on this, we make KCL and KVL, Kirchhoff's voltage law, and Kirchhoff's current law. We're going to examine those uh, shortly. Then um, there's no magnet. The other assumption that we make is that there is no magnetic coupling between components in the circuit. Okay. Magnetic coupling inside circuit elements is okay. But when it comes to external components, there is no magnetic coupling. Okay, so this is a teeny tiny, very small um, subdomain of the actual real world. Okay, the electronic, the electrical electronic systems the, in the real world um, are not restricted to be linear lump parameter time invariant case. So we are only looking at a teeny tiny subset. The engineering 17 that we are looking at is really a teeny tiny subset of the real world electronic component out there. Okay, so it's simplified analysis technique. Okay, so let's quickly look at the general design process, electrical engineering, or in any sense, in design process. Okay, in this class, so this is probably the only slide where I talk about design, okay? You do, when you go to 108 course, where you have to design an amplifier, a common emitter amplifier, okay? Or when you go to your, uh, your uh, senior design project, okay? This is where you spend a lot of your time doing design. In this class, however, we talk a whole lot more about analysis. Okay, so there is a fundamental difference between analysis and design. One is a creative process, meaning that from the um, basic understanding of circuit, how a circuit operates and the different principles, the equations that define the behavior of the circuit. You build a component, you build a system, that meets a certain specifications. The system, build system to meet specs. Okay, so this is the idea of design. Analysis, which is more the, um, which is more the, topic of interest in this class is given certain parameters, understand the behavior of a circuit, what are the different node voltages, what are the different branch currents, if we can quantify, if we can put numbers, if we can solve. So this is another word that we will come across over and over again. If we can solve for different node voltages and branch currents, that constitutes analysis. We are not per se building anything. As a matter of fact, if you think about it, we are breaking things down into first principles and looking at the behavior of circuits. 
Okay, so that's that. So this is the only slide that probably talks about design in this class. Okay, it's motivated by need. Okay, when you go to your senior design project, the first thing you are asked to do is to find a societal need that you can address using some kind of engineering solution. Okay, then you have to quantify the specifications. Okay. Specifications is the list of um, target performance metrics that you want to achieve. So specifications, you can think of it as a contract between the customer who approached you with a design. Let's say a company approached you with a um, company approached you with a uh, proposal to build, to design a certain electromechanical device, okay? So um, you, as the designer, have to design a specification, design a, a component, okay? So the specs sheet, that acts as a contract between you and the designer. They're going to ask for, uh, they're going to specify what they want in terms of power consumption, what they want in terms of the bulk, okay? What the cost should be, okay? What the, what the, um, uh, what the um, dimensions of that mechanical system should be. Okay? If you design a system, that meets all of those specifications, that's a good place for you to start. And then um, the customer can be happy about it. If there is no good specifications sheet, there is no way to quantify if you did a good job or a bad job at uh, designing your circuit. So the idea is that uh, specifications acts as a beginning and an ending document, a document where you can a, a document that can guide you in the beginning and that can also guide you um, in terms of where to stop. Okay, and then you of course build a circuit model. Okay, before you actually build a prototype, a physical prototype, you build a circuit model and then you refine over and over successive refinement. Your version 0.0, .0 is not the perfect version, but it's some kind of functional version that is quite not meeting all the specifications. Then you revise it. Then revise some more, okay? And then you revise some more, okay? So this is an iterative process where you successive refinement. Okay, this is true in the case of mechanical design. This is true in the case of electrical design. This is true in the case of software design. Okay, you want to start with very well laid out specifications sheet, and then you build a model, you test your hypothesis, you test your um, circuit model against all the specs. If it does not meet the specs, go back and design some more, go back and re revise the design some more, and then so on and so forth. Similarly, this is an iterative process. Then once you're convinced that your model is performing according to the specifications, then you go ahead and build it in a prototype, okay? You build a physical prototype of the model, then you test some more, okay? As you can see, um, from all my years of experience as a, an engineer in the industry, I work with Cadence Design Systems um, as a contractor. My wife is a software engineer. My brother works for Intel um, as an engineer. Now, the idea is that in our combined experience, and I can speak from my um, experience, that, um, that engineering design teams have just as much resources, as many resources devoted to testing as they have for designing, okay? As you can see, this 
there is multiple levels of testing. You test your circuit model, you test your physical prototype, you, de you deploy your model in the real world and do some more testing, so on and so forth. So testing is a significant component of your design process. As a matter of fact, it's so, um, so um, integrated into the design process that um, design teams typically actually have 50% of their resources, almost uh, around 50% or more devoted towards uh, testing, okay? Testing is a fundamental uh, process that in the design, um, design uh, process that gives you confidence around your design. Okay, only when you design your system over and over and over again, and test it against your specifications and benchmark it against your specifications. It's only then that you have confidence around your design, okay? So as engineers, we like to quantify and put numbers around anything that we, um, our way of understanding the world is through numbers, okay? Um, so performance, um, testing, confidence, just about everything we like to understand in terms of numbers, okay? As engineers, we solve problems. We have technical solution, optimal solution to societal problems. We design stuff and we make society a better place, okay? By designing, um, by designing, um, well thought out systems okay so um, it's not like it's not a hobby for us we engineers we do we do it for pleasure all right but we hobbies don't get paid for it we as engineers we solve societal problems both small and large problems and then what makes us different from um, a hobby is that we take this as a profession okay we get paid for it we make a living out of this so we had, um, it's more than a hobby for us. Okay, we usually get paid. Okay, if we solve a lot of problems, we should have a particular method for solving the problem. Uh, and then typically the design flow that I mentioned earlier is our de engineer's way of, of go-to solution for um, go-to methodology for solving the problem. We motivate it by need. We start with design specifications, okay? We iterate through the process and test over and over and over again. So that's the idea. We identify the problem, um, start uh, to begin with, we identify the problem, okay? And identify what we know and what we don't know. That's an important thing, okay? Unknown unknowns, known unknowns. Okay, no knows. Okay, what we know that we already know and what we don't know that we don't know. So uh, that, that's a very good way to understand, um, begin um, solving the problem is to see what do I need to know? What more additional knowledge do I need to have in order to solve this problem? Okay. Um, Donald Rumsfeld, okay, he's um, he's uh, known to be talking about known knowns, known knowns, unknown knowns, so on and so forth. Okay, and then we visualize the problem. This is a fundamental um, thing for us. We like to model things. Okay, we like to simulate things in a simulation domain even before we do it in the real world domain. Okay, and then we brainstorm for solutions. What's the range of solutions that is possible? Okay, so this is the typical design flow that an engineer follows. Okay, then we calculate, calculate, and calculate some more, and do some more calculations. Okay, so um, we solve, we deal a, we deal with numbers um, a lot. So numbers are important. That's our way of understanding. Uh, our world, our world view is informed by numbers, okay? Okay, engineers get to be creative in terms of 
being um, the designers that come up with creative solutions okay to different design problems and we like to we have to and we like to test our solution okay and then we rinse and repeat like i mentioned the design process is an iterative iterative approach okay so this is the general design flow so we talk about numbers numbers with the units okay so proper units is very very important it's a um, motivation for using proper units can come from the fact that there has been a silly disaster it's owing to silly reasons there has been a um, disaster with nasa um, lost its 125 million mars climate orbiter that's because of a mismatch between the units that uh, the two uh, the two collaborators in this project were using okay um, there was a there was a misunderstanding there was not proper communication um, between the two collaborators in terms of the units that were used and that led to a, a disaster a silly problem but a, a silly reason but a disaster is uh, result okay so it's absolutely important to have a standard unit of um, measurement okay so in that in that um, spirit what we have to do is to define standard units that we will be using throughout this course okay si units international system of units si units okay length has the units of meters mass has units of kilogram and this is all this is all topics that you're very familiar with time has units of second current has units of amperes temperature in kelvin okay amount of substance in mole and then luminous intensity in candela these are called um, the fundamental units these are the fundamental units okay and then there are definitions of these and i welcome you to go back and look at these definitions for example um, meter is defined as the length of path traveled by light in vacuum during um, a one to the 300,000th part of a second okay into the 300 million part of a second okay how much time how much distance does um, light travel in one 300 million part of a second that's defined as a kilogram that, that's defined as a meter okay so the idea is that there are standard units for all of this not only there are standard definitions there are also prototypes okay there are also prototypes that actually measure the meter that actually um, lay out what one meter should be okay so there is a prototype against which all meters uh, are standardized benchmarks okay there's this standard benchmark prototypes okay but the idea is that um, when you say meter there is a very specific um, very well defined distance that is used as a unit of measurement when i say kilogram that also has a very specific measurement and i welcome you to look at all of these uh, units definitions for these units okay so um so from the standard units that we looked at so far um, length time mass current so on and so forth okay temperature amount of substance luminous intensity we can also we can also arrive at what's known as derived units the frequency okay one over seconds is the units for that um, force energy or work power these are all electrical charge electric potential 
the systems conductance capacitance flux and inductance these are derived units as you can see the units for these components electrical resistance for example is expressed in terms of the fundamental units volts per amperes okay similarly the power is also expressed in terms of fundamental units joules per second where joules is expressed in terms of newton meter or kg meters per second square times per meter okay uh, so the idea is the derived units are expressed in terms of standard units okay so that's the idea and we'll be looking at a bunch of these in this class frequency the energy power charge potential resistance capacitance as a matter of fact we'll be talking about a whole lot of these derived units in this class as well it's very important for us to understand that there's fundamental definitions um, accepted definitions to each of these then okay then we want to be able to convert between different units so um, if we want to understand uh, how many meters in a mile okay this is going to be more a refresh okay the first homework that you see will be a refresher uh, for you um, to be able to convert from different units from one unit to another unit okay how many meters in a mile the first thing we want to do is to convert um, mile into feet so there are 50 to 80 feet per mile okay and 12 inches per feet and one meter um, per 39.373 inches okay so once i do that i can cancel the feet in the numerator in the denominator you can cancel the inches here and here and i do the math i'm left with 1609.347 meters per mile okay so from the known quantities i know for a fact that one meter is 39.37 inches and one mile is 50 to 80 feet and one feet is one foot is 12 inches i put together all of these uh, pieces of information to arrive at number of meters in a mile okay so we'll frequently use numbers as engineers we have to deal with very very large numbers and very very small numbers and everything in between okay so we have to have a handy way of representing these numbers and we memorize in terms of powers of 10 okay in terms of powers of 10 you're already familiar with this okay so this is a review okay most often we use a micro meaning 10 to the negative 3 we use milli meaning 10 to the negative 3 micro meaning 10 to the negative 6 sorry okay we use nano 10 to the negative 9 pico 10 to the negative 12 okay femto and ato are less frequently used and on the um higher side on the positive power we use kilo to mean 10 to the 3 mega meaning 10 to the 6 and giga meaning 10 to the 9 and tera meaning 10 to the 12 so these are all factors of 10 that we want to um, remember and we find them handy and useful over and over multiple times okay so that's the that's the um, standardized powers of 10. Okay. And then this is a story from Dr. Russ Tetro's uh, attendance in a conference, okay, where there was a Navy lady, a Navy officer, okay, and she was handing out um, the short pieces of wire that she called nanoseconds, okay. These were almost one foot wide one foot long okay is um, that's that's um that's signified um the distance that light traveled in one nanosecond okay 
it's a really humongous number. It's a really, really astronomically large number. The amount of time, the amount of distance that light travels in one second. Okay? It's a really large number. To wrap our head around that, it's easy to um, visualize that in terms that we can relate to. Okay, so one almost one foot wide, 12 inches um, wide, 11.8. That's how long light travels in one nanosecond. Okay, so that's, that's an interesting uh, visualization. Okay, so let's look at uh, important quantities, important um, characteristics that we look at this class. Okay, charge is the fundamental quantity that we look at. And separation of charge is called voltage. Okay, when we separate charges, it's called voltage. And the, when the voltage, when the charge is moving, that's called current, okay? So you can think of voltage and current as being artifacts of charge. They are two manifestation of two different characteristics of charge. When a charge is moving, it produces current. It's called current. When charges are separated, it leads to a potential difference. That's the idea of voltage. Okay. And then charge comes in quanta. Okay. This is a fundamental constant. The smallest charge that is possible is 1.6022 into 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Okay, charge comes in quanta. Okay, positive charge moving in direction has the same properties as negative charge moving in the opposite direction. Okay, voltage is the energy per unit charge created by charge separation. How much energy is needed to charge, to um, move a charge from one point to another point. Okay, voltage is defined as the dW over dQ, okay? That's, voltage is always measured across two terminals, okay? The V is the voltage and, uh, and W is the total energy of separated charges in joules. Q is the total charge in coulombs, okay? V is always measured across two terminals. If I have a device, voltage is measured across these two terminals. What's the voltage between these two terminals? So it's always measured as difference, potential difference between two terminals, okay? You cannot, you cannot define potential at one terminal. There has to be some reference, okay? Another but equivalent definition of voltage is the voltage between a pair of points across an element is the work required to move a particle um, with a unit charge from one point to another along a path. Okay, how much work is done in moving from point A to point B, in moving a unit charge from point A to point B? That's defined as voltage, okay? So voltage is defined as dW over dQ, okay? Similarly, I is defined as the rate of movement of charges, okay? Rate of flow of charge, okay? So I is defined as the rate of separation of, rate of flow of charge, okay? And V is defined as the um, dW over dQ, work done in moving a charge, okay? So time rate of flow of charge. That is defined as current. Current is always measured through a device. If I have a device that looks like this, how much current is flowing through the device, okay? That's the idea. As opposed to potential, voltage was always measured 
between two, two terminals. What's the voltage between these two terminals? So you always need a reference terminal when it comes to the voltage, okay? It's always measured between two terminals as opposed to current, which is always measured through a device. Current is measured through a device. Okay, so that's the idea of uh, that's the idea of voltage and current. Okay, so let's look at the ideal circuit element. When we are looking at, and here is a very very fundamental thing. This is we are only going to talk about this in the first class. When you see two wires, okay, crisscrossing each other, you can assume that there is no connection between them, unless I explicitly show a connection like so using a dot, okay? When two wires are crisscrossing each other, you can assume that there is no connection between them, okay? The only time that you have to assume a connection is when I show them explicitly using a dot or when one wire terminates on the other wire, okay? A dot at the crossing of two wires means these wires are physically connected. Okay, the wires that end at another wire are connected. So when one wire is ending at another wire, then it's connected as well. Okay, so these are some things that you're familiar with already. I'm quickly brushing up. Okay, then um, when it comes to circuit elements, okay, we like to um, show circuit elements using boxes with two terminals, okay? A terminal for in and a terminal for out, okay? The wires the, that end at the terminal of the circuit are assumed to connect to that circuit element, okay? When we want to measure the voltage, we measure the voltage across the two terminals. Particles can flow through the wire into or out of the circuit element, okay? There has to be a path in, and the path out of the circuit element. The circuit element can be resistance, can be capacitance, can be inductor, or it can be any other different um, circuit element. MOSFET, BJT, diode, so on and so forth. It is the generic structure of a circuit element. Okay, so let's look at what is called um, an abstract ideal circuit element. Okay, there are two terminals, there are two terminals, and then the voltage is measured across the two terminals. The voltage is measured between the two terminals. The potential at this terminal minus the potential at that terminal gives me the voltage across that device, okay, device. It's shown using this box here, okay? That's the device and it has two terminals, terminal one and terminal two. Okay, there is some current flowing through this. Okay, and throughout this, it cannot be, so you can think of uh, element as the most fundamental building block. So you can think of this device or the element. Okay, which can be resistance, capacitance, inductance, um, voltage, so, so on and so forth. This element is the most fundamental building block. It cannot be subdivided, okay? Based on first principles. That's the idea, okay? Now, I'm going to present to you a standard. Like I mentioned earlier, this course is all about giving you a set of tools, right? So here we go. The first set of tools is called the passive sign convention. Okay, this is a standard that I'm going to follow. Okay, when the current, the direction of the current is along the voltage drop, then I call this a positive. Okay, if the direction of current is along the voltage drop, then the current is assumed to be positive, okay? I'll show you another example here. It becomes absolutely clear, 
Okay, let's see. Let's look at this guy. And maybe I have some <coughs> right here. Okay, if you look at this, the voltage drop, there is positive voltage on the first terminal and the negative voltage on the second terminal. The current flowing through this is along the voltage drop. The voltage is dropping from top to bottom. The current is flowing top to bottom. Therefore, the current is positive. Similarly, if you look at here, if you look at this um, device or this terminal, the voltage is dropping from top to bottom. And look at the current. The current is going in this direction. Okay, The current is going from top, bottom to top. Okay, The current is this direction. The voltage is dropping this direction. Therefore, I have a negative sign. I'll give you another example. Okay, let's look at the voltage drop here. The voltage is dropping from bottom to top. Okay, that's the voltage direction. There is a higher voltage, positive meaning higher voltage on number two, lower voltage on number one. Voltage is dropping here. Look at the direction of the current. The current is flowing in this direction, opposite to the voltage drop. Okay, therefore I have a negative sign. So this is a convention that I like to follow. Okay, passive sign convention, meaning if the current direction is the same as the voltage drop, so if the current is flowing from plus to minus, then the current is positive. If the current is flowing from negative to positive, then the current is negative, okay? That's the idea of passive sign convention, okay? So that's the first technique that we encounter. Let me slowly scroll back up. Okay, so that's the passive sign convention that I follow, okay? The current in the direction of voltage drop we use positive, that's the short version. Current against the direction of voltage drop, we use negative. Okay. That's the idea. Let's see. That's the idea of um, passive sign convention. So let's look at power and energy. So far we looked at voltage which is separation of charge. Okay, current I, which is flow of charge. Okay, and then we looked at passive sign convention. Okay, we looked at passive sign convention. So let's look at power and energy. Power is defined as V times I, okay? Power is defined as energy used for time, rate of work, rate of work done, or rate of change of energy is called power. You know this, and so I'm not spending a whole lot of time on this, okay? W is energy in joules, T is in time, and P is the power, okay? Now I'm going to rearrange dW over dT as dW over dQ times dQ over dT. I'm allowed to do that because um, I can um, change the variable, okay? I can introduce an intermediate variable, okay? Q, um, around which I measure the derivative. Okay, the derivative of W with respect to Q and the derivative of Q with respect to T, I can multiply them to get dW over dT. Okay, now dW over dQ is V, okay, and dQ over dT is rate of flow of charge as per the definitions that we saw earlier. Therefore, power in electrical systems is V times I. Okay, power is VI. 
Okay, so that's the idea of power. And as I mentioned earlier, there can be the power can be either absorbed or delivered. Okay, when the current is in the let's pay attention to this because the exams are going to um, test you on this. Homeworks are going to test you on this. When the current is in the direction of the voltage drop, in accordance with the passive sign convention, the power is positive. Okay. If I have a circuit element like so, with voltage potential shown in this fashion, the current going in I from positive to negative, when the current flowing is in the direction of the voltage drop, then I have a positive power, then I call it absorbing. Similarly, when I have a negative sign for the power, then the um, element is acting as a power source, and it seems it's acting as a battery, and it's delivering power. Okay, that's the idea of uh, that's the idea of passive sign convention, and what the sign or sign or the polarity of the power signifies. If it is positive, the circuit element is absorbing power. If it is negative. It's delivering power. Okay, so that's the idea of passive sign convention. Okay, so let's see. Uh, here is an example: an iPhone battery. Okay, it has uh, specifications listed as 1440 milliampere hour or 5.45 watt hour. Okay, so we want to be able to convert that to Joules in terms of energy or in terms of charge, in terms of um, charge, what we can do is we can um, convert this into known terms. Okay. Um, the ampere hour, I replace that milliampere hour, milli with negative three. So all I have done here is replace this milliampere hour, milli with 10 to the negative three. Okay. And ampere hour, I have converted this. 60 seconds per minute, 60 minutes per hour, so that I can express all of this in terms of in terms of um, ampere seconds, which is coulombs. Okay, ampere seconds is coulombs. So I'm expressing this ampere hour in terms of coulombs. Okay. Similarly, I can express this watt hour. 5.45 watt hour in joules. In order to do that, all I'm simply doing is expressing these hours, 60 seconds per minute, 60 minutes per hour. Once I convert these hours into seconds, I have 19,620 watt seconds, which is joules per second times second, okay? Which is 19,000 620 joules. Okay, so all I have done is express this watt hour. Okay. Power is energy per time. Energy is power into time, right? So what is power? Power is time. So the product of power and energy, power and time should give me energy. So this 4.5.45 watt hour is actually energy and therefore I want to express it in terms of standard unit, therefore joules. Okay, that's what I'm doing here. Okay. Let's see. Um, we can calculate the voltage across the battery when it is delivering power. Um, we, we, we arrived at the energy, we arrived at the um, um, charge. Okay, we arrived at the charge. We know um, Q equals to VC. Okay. Amount of charge stored in there. And we should be able to de uh, divide energy by C in order to get the voltage. Okay. Similarly, um, we can look at another problem. What I want to do is I'll stop here and we'll come back to look at this problem. Okay.
you know what why don't we finish this problem uh, today because this is the only one that is left okay so the problem is how long will it take to completely charge a battery from zero charge okay and that rarely happens okay batteries are rarely fully discharged but let's assume for the sake of the problem that we are trying to charge a battery you're trying to charge a battery from zero volts okay um, and then we are using five volts as the input voltage and it can be connected in two different configurations we can be it can the battery iphone battery can be charged using 500 milliampers or 100 milliampers how long does it take in each of these cases okay um, a bit of a spoiler alert when i'm trying to charge the battery at 5 volts using 500 milliampers it should take less time as opposed to charging a battery with the same voltage the smaller current more time okay so as you can see the solution if you are trying to charge the battery okay using 500 milliampers it takes 2.18 hours as opposed to trying to charge the battery the same battery using 100 milliampers, which is going to take a lot longer, 10.98 hours. Okay, so all I'm doing here is um, DI. Okay, it's based on the fact that um, iPhone 5 stores uh, this energy, right? Energy is uh, power is energy by time. Okay, so energy should be power into time. Okay, energy should be power into time. Okay, so our energy equals to power equals to energy by time, the rate of change of energy. Therefore, time should be uh, energy by P, by power. See what I'm doing? Here is the energy, that's the energy stored. That's the energy stored in the battery that's given to us, right? That's the um, battery, the amount of energy that can be stored in a battery of iPhone 5 times V times I, that's the power, okay? This power, five times I is the power, okay? We saw that power equals to V times I, right? So all I'm doing is uh, dividing energy by power okay and dividing energy by p so that i get an estimate for t okay that's all i'm doing so when the current is 0 0.5 milli 0 0.5 amperes then it takes 2.18 hours as opposed to when i'm using a small current 100 milliamperes where it takes a lot of time okay all i'm doing here is energy by power should give me time because power is rate of change of energy okay so that's the idea of uh, that's the idea of uh, um, converting from different units into standard units okay questions please questions so far okay we'll stop here